County 911. Ma'am, I killed my boyfriend in self-defense. What did you kill him with? A gun, a loaded gun in the house. I'm standing about 10 feet from his dead body. I mean, I'm not a murderer, ma'am. I just killed him. What's your name? My name is Shana Michelle Huber. This is a story about love, but not in the traditional sense, when the feeling takes over and everyone involved is happier than ever. No, today's case is comprised of a different kind of love, one that drove Shayna Hubers to murder her boyfriend and, quote, give him the nose job he wanted. Welcome to Fear Files where we discuss and dissect the most mysterious, terrifying, and mind-bending cases from all over the world. Before we start, we would like to say that our thoughts and prayers go towards the families that fell victims to the deranged actions of this particular woman. Welcome to Kentucky, the home of the most delicious fried chicken in the world. The colonel made everyone around the globe obsessed with the taste of his 11 secret herbs and spices. And speaking of obsession, let's shift our attention towards Shayna Hubers, a girl that took her obsessive behavior to the utmost extreme. She was always a person that never took no for an answer. And when she set her mind on something, you bet that she wouldn't go down without a fight. That seems pretty positive, right? Here's where you would be wrong. A friend of Huber's said in an interview that she could be pretty dramatic when it came to boys. She gave out the information that if a guy broke up with Shayna or wasn't interested in her, she would take it pretty hard. So rejection was not on her agenda when it came to every aspect of her life. Her acquaintance added that Hubers was not fond of letting things go, but that obsessive personality wasn't all negative. It did have some positive sides that managed to serve her very well throughout her academic years. She was a straight-A student in high school and attended a lot of AP courses. She also received several accolades for academic achievement and leadership, and overall, Shayna aspired to be successful in everything she was involved in. And when someone was doing better than her, her competitive spirit and her ability to focus on what she was supposed to do made her come out on top in the end. Hubers graduated from the University of Kentucky with honors after only three years before pursuing a master's degree in school guidance counseling. Her compulsive personality was putting her on the path to a bright future, but unfortunately, the gifted student also focused her obsessive behavior elsewhere. Everything changed in 2011 when Hubers got a Facebook message from Ryan Poston, then 28 years old. Ryan Poston was a high achiever as well. He didn't have the obsession that Hubers had, but he did manage to achieve a great deal, even from an early age. He was born on December 30th, 1982, and grew up at Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, about six miles or 10 kilometers south of Cincinnati, Ohio, as the eldest of four children and the only boy. His younger sisters are Allison, Catherine, and Elizabeth Carter. He attended international high school programs in Manila in the Philippines and graduated while living in Geneva, Switzerland. He went on to Indiana University to study political science, history, and geography, before following in his father's footsteps and becoming a lawyer. Poston's grandpa and uncle were also attorneys, and because of his desire for justice, he attended Northern Kentucky University's Salmon P. Chase College of Law. Ryan was close to his father, and when his parents split and his mother, Lisa Carter, remarried Peter Carter, he didn't perceive it as a father-son rivalry. He accepted his new stepfather and relished his life with two wonderful male role models, to emphasize how important both men were in his life, he changed his middle name to Carter. Hubers was Facebook friends with Poston's step-cousin, Carissa Carlisle, and the young lawyer noticed some of Huber's images. He was immediately attracted to her and never would have thought that this beautiful and seemingly sweet girl would be the death of him. 
literally. He sent her a message, and not long after that, the two decided to meet up face to face. On Huber's 20th birthday, April 8, 2011, they met for the first time in a pub in Lexington, Kentucky. According to Poston's friends, Huber's was obsessed from the start. They claim she was extremely cold to them and focused solely on Ryan. All of her energy and focus was going toward him. As we all know, that kind of behavior can become unsettling and overbearing at times. That's how Ryan felt. He needed his own space as well, but Huber's didn't have any concept of personal space. Her friends believed that she was trying to get him to settle down with her, but he wasn't ready. He was a young attorney in Cincinnati, and his job demanded a lot of his time. Poston attempted to stop things with Huber's due to a disagreement in relationship goals. Her passion and achievement took hold, and she refused to accept defeat. In a text to a friend, Huber's said that Ryan told her that he is only with her because he feels bad when he tries to break up the relationship. The reason he feels bad is because Huber's immediately starts to manipulate him and cry because things aren't going her way. So, Poston would break up with Huber's, but then feel awful when she would start weeping. Finally, he would take her back, and things would be the way they were before. His girlfriend happy, and he, well, he would be miserable all over again. As a result, the romance lasted for a year and a half off and on. She became increasingly possessive of Poston. That fact began to trouble him. He sought the assistance of his step-cousin, Carissa Carlyle, to persuade Hubers that she needed to let him go. In a text message to Carlyle, he said, quote, This is bordering on restraining order territory. She's entered my condo three times and has refused to leave each time. Hubers alleges that Poston was emotionally abusive at around this period. Nikki Carnes, Ryan's neighbor, stated in an interview that Hubers would complain to her about Poston's actions. She stated that he would call her overweight, tell her she needed to lose weight, and that she needed a boob job. But on the other hand, Allie Wagner, a friend of Poston's for 10 years, said she never heard him even raise his voice. She described him as very geeky and really kind. She said that Ryan was raised well, having manners, and would never stoop to such a level that he would offend a woman, let alone his own girlfriend. Poston enjoyed shooting firearms, so Hubers would occasionally accompany him to the shooting range. Hubers texted a friend on October 2, 2012, saying that she had a strong desire to turn around and shoot him. The text was meant as a joke, of course. Or was it? Even though he couldn't shake Hubers, Ryan started talking to other girls. In October of 2012, he had set up a date with another woman. Her name was Audrey Bolt and was Miss Ohio, USA in 2012. The two talked on Facebook Messenger and made plans to hang out at a bar. Poston informed Hubers that he would be unable to visit her that weekend, but made no mention of the date. She did, however, find out. She became acquainted with this beauty queen after seeing that Poston and Bolt had been friends on Facebook, and she was able to learn about the couple's intentions by stalking both of them on social media. After Hubers was detained, authorities made some surprising discoveries on her phone. She would continually text Poston and even make up scenarios to persuade him to spend time with her. Shayna would bombard her boyfriend with messages and looking at their conversations, it was clear that Ryan was sick of this behavior. Poston would sometimes turn off his phone so he could get some peace of mind. One time, Hubers made up a fake story saying that her Aunt Kia was on her deathbed and that she was going to see her in Hawaii. The reason she texted Ryan was to ask him to drive her to the airport. Of course, he said yes, but as it turned out, the entire story was a complete fantasy. Even though she informed him that she had a one-way ticket, the cops couldn't discover any record of it after searching her computer. Hubers texted Poston on October the 12th, 2012, the day before their date, stating that she had woken up in the middle of the night with chest troubles 
and had been brought to the hospital. She was hooked up to an EKG and was on her way to a specialist. But none of that was true. What was actually going on was that Hubers was home, looking up information regarding high blood pressure and heart disease on the internet. She would Google pills for the left ventricular hypertrophy, then inform Poston that she had the condition and had the list of medications her physician had prescribed for her. Later that day, Shayna Hubers arrived at Ryan Poston's condo before he could depart for his date. There was an altercation, and then bullets were fired. What did you kill him with? A gun, a loaded gun in the house. Can you tell me where the gun is right now? A gun is in the house. I, I laid it on the bookshelf. Where are you? I'm standing about 10 feet from his dead body. Okay, are you sure that he is dead? He's dead, ma'am. He's completely dead. Okay. And how long ago did you shoot him? Ten or fifteen minutes ago? Yeah. Okay, what's your name? My name is Shada Michelle Huber. The officers don't want me to stay on the line with you, so when you get when they get there, they're gonna to wanna to know where that gun is and we want you to get out safely too, okay? Okay, are they gonna arrest me? Uh, Ma'am, I don't know what they'll do. We're gonna send send them out. I'm gonna stay on the line with you, okay? I mean, I'm not a murderer, ma'am. I just killed him. What, what, what happened exactly? What happened? He beat me and tried to carry me out of the house, and I came back in to get my things, and he was right in front of me, and he reached down and grabbed the gun, and I grabbed it out of his hand and pulled, pulled the trigger. A call was made to 911. The first thing that Huber said was that she had killed her boyfriend in self-defense. The operator started asking different questions. She wanted to know if Ryan was still alive when she shot him, if the gun was hers, and what prompted the girl to resort to such a horrible action. The murderer said that she acted in self-defense, even insisting on that particular aspect. Then she said that she wasn't a killer and that her boyfriend was attacking her, grabbing her and throwing her against a couch. Upon being asked where did she get the gun, Hubers said that it was his, that he kept loaded weapons in the house and had threatened her with it. Another statement she gave was that she shot him 15 minutes before calling 911. The operator was surprised, wondering why did it take so long to call authorities. Upon investigating, the police decided that Hubers took so long because she needed time to get her story straight. After being questioned on the phone until several officers would arrive at the condo, she said that she shot Ryan multiple times, the reason being that he was struggling and didn't have much to live, so she decided to put him out of his misery and finish the job. Furthermore, Shayna said that she put the gun on a bookshelf, but it seemed that she had questions of her own. After giving the operator her name and the victim's name, and saying that they were breaking up before the shooting and that he was going to throw her out of the apartment, she wanted to know if she would get arrested when the officers got there. The operator said that she wouldn't know what would happen, but that she should stay on the phone until they arrive. While they were waiting, Hubers kept talking, saying that she isn't a murderer, and to better solidify her defense, she stated that Ryan was beating her up and kicked her out the door. But then she tried to come back and get her things. That's when he reached down and grabbed a gun, right before she grabbed it from his hand and pulled the trigger. And even though she was accusing him of being violent that day, when asked if she is hurt or in need of an ambulance, she responded by saying that she was fine. The statement that she was trying to calmly get her things so they could finally break up sounded nothing like what she would do. And why would he be angry about that? He had been trying to end things with her for some time, and it all happened just hours before he was supposed to go on a date with another woman. It makes no sense. In the first interview, she said that she shot him after he was on the floor. Why would she do that after he was completely immobilized? He was no longer capable of being a threat to anybody. But she shot him several times after that because he was twitching and in pain. 
Hubers was apprehended on the spot and escorted to the police station for interrogation. The interview began after she was told her Miranda rights. The police didn't have to urge Hubers to speak out since she was open about what had happened. Her initial concern, though, had nothing to do with Ryan Poston. She was terrified that no one would want to marry her after learning that she had killed her boyfriend in self-defense. Then the conversation continues to be about her. She's already thinking what she'll do if she gets away with murder. She believes that she may never marry because everything has been so stressful for her. Hubers then goes on to explain what transpired that prompted her to shoot Poston. He was incredibly egotistical, she said, and in addition to telling her that she was fat and needed a boob job, he also wanted a nose job of his own. Quote, I gave him the nose job he wanted, end quote, the perpetrator told the authorities. Poston, she claimed, had insulted her family before picking her up and throwing her on the couch. She doesn't say anything here about picking up the gun, but at the time of the shooting, she said that he was half sitting, half standing at a table, and that when she shot him, he sat down into the chair and his head went forward onto the table. Now, according to the 911 call, she said that they had been fighting and that he was right in front of her and had reached down, grabbed a gun, and that she grabbed it out of his hand and shot him. But now, during her second statement, he was at the table when this happened. It seemed that her story isn't coherent and that she made stuff up as she goes along. Throughout the interviews, Huber spoke with several investigators, but one thing remained consistent. She insisted that she shot him numerous times because he was in a lot of pain and she wanted to put an end to it. Was she trying to convince the police that that's what happened? Or was she trying to convince herself? Hubers was placed in a questioning room by Lieutenant Fornash. Hubers began making noises like she was attempting to cry or wail as the lieutenant stood up and walked out the door to exit the room. But as soon as Fornash left, she stopped. When she was alone in the questioning room, she began walking about and singing to herself. She never stopped talking in the questioning room. She asked as to what was life like in prison. She was curious if people were allowed to bring their cell phones. Hubers even asked as to whether the showers were accessible or if people were just filthy. Shayna Hubers was accused of Ryan Poston's murder, to which she pled not guilty and said that she shot him in self-defense. Despite her claims that he was beating her up and throwing her around the room, authorities discovered no trace of struggle inside the condo. Hubers said that Poston threw her into a bookcase, but a photograph of the same bookshelf revealed that everything was still in place. Books remained upright and a pipe remained stable on a little wooden stand. The cherry on the investigative cake was Huber's allegation that Poston had shut himself in his bedroom at one time. So he's attacking her, yet he's locked himself in his room. Not only that, but her phone's history revealed that she had used the computer to find out how to unlock a house door using a bobby pin. She was successful and was able to gain access to his bedroom. Evidence on the weapon revealed that Shayna walked closer to Poston when she shot him, as opposed to someone being assaulted who would typically move away from their assailant. When Hubers learned the evidence, she claimed that Poston was approaching her when she fired, although this contradicted all of her earlier accounts of the incident. She claimed that she shot him and he collapsed face down on the table. He was twitching, so she shot him again and he dropped to the ground. Suddenly, he's charging at her? In an attempt to demonstrate that she acted in self-defense, she launched many charges against Poston. On their first date, she said he reached up her dress and touched her thigh. She also claimed that they had rough intercourse, but several texts revealed a different scenario. On October 3, 2012, she texted Poston, saying that she had some beautiful corsets that she had never worn, and she would like to do some bedroom role play. Ryan reacted to this text message by saying he isn't interested in such things. The downstairs neighbors of Poston testified 
that they heard the gunshot. They claimed to have gotten home around 8.30 p.m. and heard a woman weeping on his porch. About 15 minutes later, they heard two shots that they mistook for firecrackers, but then heard four more rounds in quick succession that made them understand that they were gunshots. When asked if they heard any squabbles or fights, they said no. They confirmed that if there had been a physical confrontation and she was flung across the room, they would have been able to hear it. Hubers did not testify in her own defense, although she did apologize for her acts. She said, just before her sentence was handed down, that she apologizes to her family. She also apologized to her friends for disappointing them, and she felt remorse because her parents had to spend so much money on lawyers. But Hubers never apologized to Ryan Poston's family for what she did. She was found guilty of Ryan Poston's murder on April 23, 2015, after five hours of jury deliberation, and was sentenced to 40 years in prison, with the possibility of release after 20 years. Her defense attempted to persuade the judge to acknowledge Hubers as the victim of domestic violence, which would have resulted in a lower sentence for her, but the judge refused. You must be married to the victim or live with them full time to be recognized as a victim of domestic violence. Hubers attempted to pretend that she lived with Poston, but this was untrue. Hubers' conviction was reversed in August of 2016 after it was uncovered that one of the jurors had lied about their criminal history and had been convicted of a crime. On August 8th of 2018, her second trial began. Hubers had met someone in county jail about the same time and they were planning on getting married. She called the media as soon as they submitted their request to the jail to marry. She spoke with WCPO's Craig McKee about her newfound love and how she felt about her upcoming trial. While being imprisoned at the county jail, Hubers encountered a transsexual inmate, Richard McBee, who identified as a woman and goes by Unique Taylor. He was arrested and booked into the Campbell County Detention Center on robbery charges. When the two met, they decided to get married. They sent a marriage request to the detention center. Of course, though, everyone was retaliating against them. Because they did not receive an immediate answer, the prison is on the lookout for her. Of course, this is not the case because the two married in jail on June 7th, two months after her second trial began. Hubers took the stand and testified in her own defense. Her story shifted once more. He was now on top of her, holding her by the hair and yanking her head around. When asked about her initial statement, saying that he was at the table, Hubers pretended that it was something she had never heard about and that she had never said that. At her second trial, Shana Hubers was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with the chance of parole after 20 years. Hubers filed for divorce from Taylor seven months after their marriage. The marriage was irretrievably shattered, according to the divorce petition. Shana Hubers is now incarcerated in the Kentucky Correctional Institute for Women, serving time for the brutal murder she committed. So, these are the lengths love can take a person. Everything has a good and a bad side, and we should be careful to balance the two, or the consequences can be brutal. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below on your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Also, hit that notification bell to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, Keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.